This is one of my favorite pictures. People will be dressed. Oh, I, I remembered to bring my piece. It's perfect. It's perfect. I'm going to put this, I think he's on the newsletter. Why not? I mean, we were, we were green at the last time we were green movie. As a matter of fact, perfect. Kate triggered the paper. Suggested on the very last day that we should bring our home church yes. t-shirts yes. with yes. us yes. To, to, to symbolize so, going back out. Yeah, no, that's perfect. perfect. All right, well, we're a smaller group today, but we are going to have so much fun with our wonderful Craig, who is going to be presenting on his time at the General Assembly. I know. Sherry, was it 2018 you went? I went in 2016. We were trying to figure out who else in the church has gone. Daniel and I, we both went in 2016. Who else I, went, I went in 2012, and Wendy Deutsch went in 2012, but ironically, in 2012, Wendy was not a member yet here. Yeah, yeah. There we go. So we're so grateful that Craig, who not only spent his time for oh, about a week, right? Yeah. In, in Salt Lake City, but is now presenting to us about his time there and his experience there. So, Craig, Thank we're going to Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Greetings, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, you probably all have a little bit of an inkling, but I, I will start at the very beginning saying, what is G? Okay, it's the most inclusive body of the PCUSA, the highest ecclesiastical body within PCUSA, and commissioners are um, elected by the local presbyteries uh, to the General Assembly, and we're made up of an equal number of, or as much as reasonably possible, of ruling elder commissioners, that is people who are serving on sessions for former uh, session members and teaching elders, otherwise known as ministers of word and sacrament. Um, there are now 168 presbyteries in the uh, PCUSA, and uh, there were each electing two uh, teaching elder commissioners and, if possible, two uh, elder commissioners. So there were a total of 500 commissioners. Uh, present at uh, GA. Um, also, it's more than just commissioners. There are ruling, I'm sorry, there are young adult advisory delegates, otherwise known as YADs, and way back in 1972, I was a YAD. So well, you've been three times. That's right, that's right. <laughs> I forgot about that, but yeah. Uh, 1972, I was a GAD commissioner from Presbytery of Hudson River, and we went out to Denver then. Quite frankly, I don't remember much of that, but <laughs> be that as it will. There's also theological seminary advisory delegates, and what that means is people from theological seminaries um, have um, an opportunity to go uh, with a uh, voice, but not vote. Um, they are advisory in capacity, just like the YADs are advisory in capacity. And then we also have ecumenical uh, advisory delegates from different denominations from all over the world who convene uh, at the General Assembly um, conclave. Um, and GA meets every two years in rotating cities. Um, uh, usually what happens is GA occurs late June, early July on um, alternate years. Um, the, the previous February, we, we start our training uh, to become a GA commissioner. And um, thank goodness this time around and for future GAs, Plug for any elders here who want to put their name in for Milwaukee in two years. The training is, is now on Zoom. So you don't have to go to the Presbytery office to receive your training. About 10 hours of training in total, and it's a guided, um, I guess you would call it a 
and training and exercise and you answer questions, but something you can do at your own time, at your own convenience, and it's real easy to do. Um, 2018 was the last GA where uh, the two components of GA, the plenary session where everybody meets all together, and then the committee work, which happens before, uh, 2018 was the last year that all that was done on site, meaning in a specific city. Um, in 2020, because of the pandemic, they didn't have any committee work in what's called the plenary session, meaning where the necessary business to run the denomination happens, uh, was done on Zoom. And then in 2022, what they did is have the committees meet um, in Louisville, or down there they say Louisville, um, separately, and then they did the plenary session on Zoom. And I tuned into the 2022 plenary session on Zoom, and it really didn't work too well. I mean, to have 500 commissioners all with your little Hollywood Square on the, on the, you know, on your computer and trying to raise your hand for a question and resolutions and resolutions from the floor, that really didn't work too well. So in 2024, the one I'm speaking of today, what they did was to have the committee meetings on Zoom and then two, three day administrative catch up time and then the actual plenary session in Salt Lake City. Um, and jumping ahead, one of the things that, or one of the resolutions that went to the floor and uh, was defeated was let's go back to having committee meetings <laughs> and plenary sessions in the same city until the number, the dollar number crunchers got involved and said, do you realize across the denomination more than $750,000 per day to have you all hosted and have the facilities um, open uh, on a per day basis <laughs> just to have you there. And we don't want to spend that kind of money. So although it's really great to have you know, um, um, hospitality suites and that kind of thing to, to uh, fellowship the, the before and after um, uh, meetings. Um, there was a little bit of that at, uh, at uh, Salt Lake. Um, but um, uh, we said, let's for Milwaukee in two years keep it with the current um, uh, setup <coughs> of having the committee meetings on Zoom and just have the necessary plenary business where we meet as a, uh, as a, as a group. Um, yeah? Oh, there we go. Um, have the plenary <coughs> be all together. So that, what we did in Salt Lake City earlier this year is what we're gonna do in, in Milwaukee and be better stewards of our of our resources. Um, so, committee meetings. Uh, they were held the third week in June in the comfort of your home, and commissioners are randomly assigned to a committee. So you really can't put in your digs as to which committee you're gonna serve on. In 2012, I served on the ecumenical and interfaith uh, committee, and then this past year, uh, I served on the environmental uh, and earth care uh, committee. And just to kind of give you, I'm just going to rattle them off in terms of all different kinds of committees that uh, uh, contribute to the GA. Bills and overtures, Christian formation, which includes Christian ed and adult ed, domestic engagement, think of it as mission within the United States, ecumenical and interfaith partnership, that was the one I was on 12 years ago, Environmental and Climate Justice, that's the one I just served on. Financial Resources, 
General Assembly Entity Coordination. That's what I would call statistics, management, and administration. General Assembly procedures. That is, people, uh, the commissioners have to vote how to run the next year's General Assembly. Um, international engagement. What is our stand on international affairs? How do we run our Office of Public Witness in Washington, D.C.? You know, what is our policy on, or, or whatever. Um, Mid-councils, the fact that we're a connectional church. We have the local session, we have the presbytery, we have the synod, and then we have the general assembly. And how do all those um, bodies, all those councils of the church relate and interact to each other, and who has the power? That is, what powers are bestowed upon the session versus the presbytery versus the synod versus the general assembly? Um, ordination, ordination exams, more on that later. Um, plenary, how things are run at the specific general assembly. If we have time, I'm going to be showing you uh, three quick videos of um, the other three commissioners. And one of the commissioners, Robin Palmer Burton, who's the pastor of the Highlands Church, not Highlands Presbytery, but the Highlands Church next to Hackettstown, she got the gumption to say uh, at the beginning of the final day of General Assembly, she went and got the microphone and said, look, we have half of our business yet to do, but only 25% of the time. I move that for the rest of the General Assembly, everybody only has one minute to speak instead of two minutes to speak. So we can get through all the business and not be up until 11 o'clock at night like we were at the previous General Assembly. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it went through. Mm -hmm. So how a General Assembly is run is up to the General Assembly. Um, polity, that has to do with the Book of Order. And there were some modest Book of Order changes, but kind of like a constitutional amendment in the United States, any type of book of order changes needs to be filtered back down to the presbytery level and have a two-thirds majority vote at the presbytery level. So no, if you will, con um, constitutional changes uh, within PCA, PCUSA are just solely or exclusively done at the, at the General Assembly level. Um, race, sexuality, and gender justice is also a committee. So the committees had between 40 to 60, I'm sorry, 40 to 70 commissioners. Um, and there was a docket, and there were five staffers per each of these committees. And the five staffers were a moderator, an assistant moderator, a Zoom specialist, because remember, all the committees were being done on Zoom, um, what's called an equity crime specialist. And that is something new to this specific General Assembly, which is they felt very strongly that somebody should be on monitoring the uh, committees and the General Assembly itself to make sure that every voice got heard and nothing was being railroaded through. So even on the committee Zoom, there was a staffer's position, times 12 committees, whose sole job was, ha has every voice been heard? Um, a, par a parliamentarian was on the committees uh, as well. Um, so, and there were uh, uh, overture advocates who were not commissioners who, if there was a specific overture to uh, that the committee had to uh, deliberate or address or was brought to the table. Um, it's kind of like an expert witness if you see, you know, uh, congressional committees and expert witnesses. We had our own uh, expert witnesses speak on the specific uh, overture proposals that were brought forth to the committee level. Um, and all committees' proceedings were live time t 
two-way translated into both Korean and Spanish, which I think is a major feat because not only are we an English-speaking denomination, but we are a Korean-speaking denomination and we're a Spanish-speaking denomination. So we had a commissioner who spoke only Spanish, who was Zooming from Puerto Rico, and God bless them, they had a Spanish to English translator on the Zoom times 12 committees to make sure that uh, that commissioner's um, uh, words were heard by, by all of us. Um, where were my God sightings for um, GA? One of my God sightings was, believe it or not, at the committee level uh, on Zoom where we had, just like the live committee, we had opening worship every morning we, that we logged in as a Zoom committee. And one of our um, theological, no, our ecumenical advisory delegates was logging in from Myanmar, hmm. which was 5 a.m. the next day for him, okay? And he led us in a touching, rousing version of, in Christ there is no East or West. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my gosh, if somebody from literally halfway around the world the next day can live stream, in Christ there is no East or West, we're truly a connectional church. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take a break from my rambling on, and I'd love to show you the three videos of the um, other commissioners and just kind of their perceptions on that. Um, that this all came about. I will start with my fellow um, ruling elder commissioner, uh, Alec Chain from the- Hello friends. Uh, my name is Alec Jan. I am a ruling elder commissioner um, that had the privilege of serving at the recent uh, General Assembly for the Presbyterian Highlands. Um, a short video about my experience, the pros and cons, what I've learned, and um, what I would take away from uh, the experience that I had the privilege of serving. Um, I served on the coordination committee. Um, it was a very interesting uh, opportunity for me to learn uh, some of the challenges and the ability uh, for um, underprivileged, um, underprivileged congregations to have access to ministers and attracting ministers and the ability to um, worship Sundays without a minister present. Uh, being privileged in the Northeast, we sometimes take that for granted that you know we have the accessibility of some of the uh, some of the talent that's out there, and um, uh, and a lot of talented people that want to serve in in, in this area, uh, particularly in the Highlands. Um, so it was great from hearing from some of my colleagues, um, and obviously uh, some of my fellow worshipers on some of the challenges that they faced. Um, in, in their ministries and their and, and their um, some of the ads had a lot of talking points and were really interested in participating, um, which you know, which sometimes we um, as or sometimes we experience as younger people that sometimes we just don't have a voice. Um, so it was an interesting opportunity for them to voice their concerns and opinions, um, and and obviously. Hear from their side um, of what they're looking for in, in worship and what they're looking for in, in, in the process of ordination. And maybe some of themselves are going through that process of ordination or thinking about going into um, in, into ministry as well. Um, I did. Uh, I, I will say that the overall uh, experience with the uh, with doing our community work prior in a hybrid capacity and. In person was a great combination of time management, um, especially for people like myself who have a full-time job and can't commit to a week or two weeks of being away from home and or work. So I, I did like the process on how how that um, how that was carried out. I also did enjoy the process of the general assembly and how efficient it was and 
and did not allow it to kind of go off topic and rogue and, and whatnot, really kept, really kept us engaged and really allowed us uh, continuously to be able to voice our opinion. And it doesn't matter if you were from a congregation um, that had 80 people or you're a congregation that had 8,000 people. So it was really encouraging to see that um, a lot of that was going on. Um, aside from that, I am, obviously it's a short, minute, short video, but I uh, love to kind of connect with other people and share my experience as we kind of move forward. Thank you. Bye. And secondly, let me hop to, I mentioned Robin Palmer Burton. This is her video. My name is Robin Palmer Burton, and I'm the pastor of Highlands Presbyterian Church in Nevada. I want to thank you for giving me the privilege of representing the Highlands Presbyterian General Assembly. I served on the General Assembly Procedures Committee. Our first task was whether or not to recommend that the next General Assembly be in, be in Milwaukee. You would think that would be an easy task. But two hours later, a brief discussion, it finally passed by one vote. You see, many people were concerned about having the committee meetings on Zoom. It was sometimes difficult to have the discussions that we needed to have. And also sometimes the Zoom links weren't working well coming out of General Assembly. We had heard from many people, including um, somebody that spoke about the financial implications and that would add a million dollars to the budget for us to have the committee meetings in person. We also worked on a 90 page document. But there but, but that's the picture of the plenary where we all can be trying to update. We read through it, heard it from many people, including the people that wrote the work circle on the committee that wrote the document, and also people that either were supporting it or had concerns. It took us pretty much two days to work through the document and we were the last committee that finished on Thursday night at 11 12 p.m. Eastern Time. When I think about the entire General Assembly, I think about the stories that we heard, especially from our young adult advisory delegates. The listening to their stories about gun violence really touched my heart. Listening to them saying that you know, they, some that had experienced it already in their schools, new friends that had either been shot or killed, and talking about the drills that they had to do in case there was an active shooter in the schools. They listened to stories from LGBTQ plus young people also, and, and, and older, talking about how they either had been accepted in their church or how they had been shunned by the church and how it had affected their lives. We listened to stories of Korean women, especially Korean women pastors, how they were not accepted in their congregations, not by usually the male Korean pastors, but often the other members of the church, male and female, and just some of the prejudice that they had faced. I also really appreciate our moderators, and for anyone who is interested in going to the General Assembly, especially the next one, they will be the moderators for the next General Assembly. Because one of the things that we passed in the document that our committee worked on was that the moderators will be elected at the end of the General Assembly, not at the beginning. We had a lot of fun with them. They had a great sense of humor. I love their pastoral experience and how they would just stop and pray, whether it was something that was happening in the world, pray about something at a moment in general assembly. And they also knew when to be stirred to keep us in line. And so I think that we will truly appreciate them. And then in many things that we worked on in the course of the week, um, hopefully that you have read a lot about it and many things that have been posted online. But we look forward to sharing more of those things with you as we meet together on the 25th, but also as we come up for the votes in our Presbyterian meetings in the future. Thank you again for your support along the way. And last but not least, uh, my friend, uh, Reverend Rich Kelsey. Hello, friends and family in the Presbytery of the Highlands. 
It was a privilege and a profound pleasure to be one of your commissioners to the 226th General Assembly. This was my first GA experience in 25 years of ordained service, and I am glad to say it has made me an even more puzzled Presbyterian, not because I am questioning our identity as the PCUSA, but because I'm rejoicing more than ever before in our being a connection of the church. I was so inspired to be just one piece in a great big God glorifying. There are many individual moments that keep coming to mind from my time on the Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations Committee, my city with Craig and Robin and Alec during plenary and GA worship, my interactions with delightfully diverse delegates from across our country, my attending worship and fellowship, and a Guns to Garden demonstration at First Presbyterian of Salt Lake City, and, and just a whole lot more. But it is all of these and more connected in Christ that by grace and through faith has freshly fueled my passion and calling in an hour of ministry. It was really a writ large version of all that I first fell in love with about the PCUSA as a 19 year old counselor at our beloved Camp Johnsonburg. I was most especially moved by the passionate integrity and precious identities of the young adult advisory delegates, the in-person words of bold witness from partner church leaders in places like Grenada, Myanmar, Brazil, Portugal, South Africa, Egypt, and Scotland, by the superb worship music team, by all the people working so hard behind the scenes, and by the excellence and prayerful leadership of newly elected co moderator CC. The wisdom and the discernment necessary for voting on many vital issues didn't always come easily to me or the gathered body. Yet I do fully believe we were all empowered by the expansive love of Jesus Christ, and the assembly business was carried out decently and in good order. Amen. <laughs> so thank you all for electing me, and please know how much I look forward to carrying on the priorities of the 226th General Assembly. He is an excellent um, video, but he alludes to a subtle and we forewarned um, uh, point of being a commissioner. Technically, I am still a commissioner to the 226th General Assembly, and my duties as commissioner, if there's some emergent issue that the General Assembly as a body needs to deliberate and decide upon, I can be called back. Now, in reality, that would happen in Zoom. We wouldn't all go back to Salt Lake City. But I am still a commissioner until the commissioners for the 227th General Assembly are elected in two years. So there was a little whisper, be forewarned. You know, it's kind of like that phrase, once an elder, always an elder, you know? So that uh, is a slim possibility, but still a possibility never, nevertheless. Um, just to zero in on, on a couple little things before we uh, wrap it up, um, one of the um, issues, and you wouldn't think it would be an issue, on the environmental committee that I was serving on was um, total financial divestment in oil and non-renewable companies. And when you consider the Presbyterian Foundation, PILP, I'm, I'm blanking, but we have a number of different financial um, entities within the denomination. No, maybe, let me see. Like, what else? Um, like the Board of Pensions. Board of Pensions, right. The Board of Pensions. And, and uh, there's a fourth. But we have a fairly large nest egg, which is invested in revenue generating, you know, stocks. We have already said no 
to any stock that involves guns or weapons of war. We've already said no to any um, alcohol um, related companies. Um, so you would think that going for non-renewable um, uh, oil and uh, plastics would be a no-brainer. And I was on the Environmental Committee and we kind of lobbied to put a resolution forth to uh, uh, direct the General Assembly to say, you know, re re um, let's phase out of those stocks. At first, on one day at General Assembly, it was approved. The next morning, it was rescinded. Mm -hmm. And the rationale, and I have to tell you, I was on the fence as far as this overture was concerned myself. And the reason being is that we do have a committee of General Assembly called the Mission Responsibility Through Investment Committee or MRTI, and basically they are the overseers to see what investments the denomination's financial resources are invested in. And you would say, oh, what, what would be, you know, what would be the other side to that question, or the other side of that issue? Basically, what MRTI says is you have to pay to play. That is, if we don't have financial investment into these companies, can we, how else can we affect change from the inside of the company? Meaning, if you can't stand up and speak at Chevron's stockholders' annual convention, you know, how else can you affect change from the inside out? So that was their rationale. So, if, so the initial uh, overture was rescinded, uh, but I'm sure it's going to be an ongoing question. That is, how do you ethically affect change? Uh, is it through your pocketbook? Is it through uh, resolutions and overtures? You know, how, how do you affect change to make, make it a better world? Um, every time that an overture came to the plenary session, there was a, um, somebody from the GA accounting office to say, how much additional is this overture going to impact on our per capita? And we were very proud that as a result of all the overtures that were passed pending presbytery, uh, local presbytery's approvals, 64 cents. So, and when you think about it's only out of the, what's our total per capita now? 40? 42.50. 40, okay, 42.50. Only 10.64 of that goes to general assembly funding that just having a 64 cent increase over a period of two years, considering inflation, is, is not bad. But for every overture that came, before us, there was somebody standing up there saying what would be the financial implications if this overture were ratified, so that we would have, you know, the, the pluses and the minuses of, um, you know, our approval or not um, for that. And just to think that um, the General Assembly is not something that is, you know, out there, um, one overture came from the Highlands Presbytery, and it was concurred upon by a number of different presbyteries, and it was in the ordination uh, section, and uh, specifically when it comes to ordination exams. And there was a, um, a concern that the Standing Committee, there we go. Presbytery's Cooperative Committee on Ex Examinations for Candidates. Um, they are the ones who basically develop the ORD exams that all 
ministers of the word and sacrament have to sit for and pass. Um, two years ago, um, there was an ordination question that could have triggered uh, issues of personal trauma or history of personal trauma to the uh, potential ministers of word and sacrament who were sitting for that exam. And there was kind of a backlash as to how could a, a question, an exegesis question, um, get on the org exam. And so what our the overture that our local presbytery uh, put forth is, let's look at the Presbytery's co uh, Cooperative Committee on Examinations and Candidates. And that was passed, that um, overture was passed, and as a result, our um, Presbytery's um, clerk and resource manager, Reverend Dr. Steve Schusett, was appointed to be on this committee so that ordination questions in the future would not, would be fair and ones that uh, would not um, hopefully e evoke um, painful history of ordination candidates. Would I likely become a, a commissioner in 2026? No, probably not. I'm going to leave that all to, to you all, and uh, I'm sure since it is a rotational basis, uh, you know, everybody's voice is a voice that should be heard when it comes to uh, General Assembly. But I think what I will do when it comes to Milwaukee in 26 is become one of the worker bees because any type of um, confluence of people and ideas and resources as what has happened on the General Assembly is um, uh, not without a lot of people behind the scenes. From our presbytery this past year in, in the, the 2024, we had Elder Joe Martinoni, uh, from just up the road here, Reverend Stephen Choi, Reverend Dr. Steve Schusett, uh, they all were um, overture assistants or committee chairs or just people who just helped the process to, to move along. And I think if the uh, uh, General Assembly Committee uh, you know, wishes, I would put my name in to you know, be a worker bee to help uh, uh, things go along for uh, 2026. So that's all from, from my perspective, and I, I welcome questions. We have a few minutes here. So, yes? Craig, when you were, when you were talking about the investment decisions, yeah. is that just for money held by the General Assembly, or does that translate down to the individual church endowments? You know, you know what I mean? Good question. I think it does not um, trickle down to the individual church endowments. I think you are, there's nothing within the denomination that says what an individual church endowment can or cannot invest in. Um, this was just in terms of um, denomination held uh, resources. Okay. Good presentation. Thank you. Very interesting. What was the biggest topic that you felt was spent the most time on that people were either excited about or kind of not sure what, you know, if they had a resolution for it that the General Assembly had? Gosh, I don't think there was a one biggest topic. Uh, I know, like in 2026, uh, I'm sorry, 2016. You know, LGBTQ was 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 hot then as it was in the 2014. Um, I, I would say this environmental uh, overture that I was speaking about was was a biggie. Uh, gun violence resolutions, uh, deploring gun violence again. Uh, 
we, our overtures can be, if you will, laws within a denomination, but they can also be position statements. And how do we as a denomination stand for certain societal issues? So um, gun violence was, was one. Here's an interesting one for you, and it had to do with ordination again. Um, obviously, we as a church uh, are now all inclusive in terms of um, our, our beliefs on LGBTQIA plus and people from, uh, it almost seems that silly to talk about now, but people from different ethnic or, or, or racial upbringings or, or what have you. But <clears throat> when you're examining a potential ministerial candidate, can you hold their personal beliefs on these issues against them in the ordination process? And this was called the Olympia Overture. And the uh, answer was that no, you cannot hold their personal beliefs at, on these issues against them in your examination of ministerial candidates. Huh. Which, now, how they practice the words, it was called the Olympia Overture, how they practice their ministries is a whole different thing. But what are their personal beliefs on, on these issues? You can't hold that one way or the other as a prejudice against ordaining them. You know, very interesting. So I, I wouldn't say that it's really one hot button issue, but um, a number, a number of issues. This is a silly question. Yeah. When, when was the first General Assembly? Well, it depends what you consider the, the PCUSA. Come on, church historians, help me yeah, out. Man. Well, the first General Assembly was convened in Florida, in Philadelphia, wasn't it, by James Monroe, or James Madison? That's right. But it wasn't PCUSA, it no. was Presbyterian Church. With the combination of the North and the South? That's right. So that would have been in Atlanta. 80s. Yeah. In the 80s? No. Yeah, 1980s, um, by, the, by what we now call PCUSA. Yeah, because we had PCUS, and then we had PCA, and then it became PCUS. Right, yeah. yeah. But I don't think that they started the numbering system over again, obviously, in the last four right. years. Right. So yeah, I don't. The first one must have gone back yeah. a long time. Yes, for a while, didn't they meet on an annual basis? Yes. I there was a while, that. right? Yeah. I can't it's remember only when they the last stopped 20 that. Years or so that yeah. On every other year yeah. To save money. Yeah. Because it took so much energy to put yeah. it on. Yeah. Yeah. How Different. how active is our presence in Washington? Do we? You there's a, there's a group there, right? Oh yeah. That, that represents awesome CCUSA. And and do they have a voice? I mean, are they effective? Are they getting through to anybody? Uh, but that's maybe a question beyond your scope. But. That, that's the question that intrigues me right now. Well, there, there have been pronouncements, and we had our former director of Office of Public Witness arrested. Um, and what was he standing? I think he was standing for either a homeless or, or marching, and a, one of them. Washington marches on uh, fair treatment of in indigenous populations or maybe racial, but he was one of 20 who was, was arrested hmm. for disorderly conduct. Um, one of the things we also have to prayerfully uh, think about is the fact, and this was discussed kind of peripherally at plenary, but it was discussed, our denomination, as a denomination, for the first time, dipped just slightly below the one million mark in terms of members nationally. Gotcha. And you know, one side of the of the of the of the, uh, 
floor, if you will. Oh, we're, we're going down the tubes. And then the other side of the, of the floor basically said, well, let's make lemonade out of lemons. What truly constitutes membership? Mm -hmm. Should we reinvent the definition of membership and not be membership in a local congregation uh, or a local church, but rather engagement? Mm -hmm. I mean, think of here at PCM, of we have a number of people who are engaged in our activities who maybe come and go and uh, link up for one activity who are not members. Should we in some way consider them as being participatory in the life of the church, of the greater church? So it, you know, the statistics people kind of, kind of, uh, took a step back and say, all right, it's a larger quest, it's a larger issue than just simply numerical numbers of membership within PCUSA. And then the other, then the other issue is, how do we, how do we get our financial resources? Mm -hmm. Is per capita still a viable, which, which depends upon the, our current definition of membership, you know, is, is per capita the best way to garner our resources as, as a denomination? That's another uh, uh, question. The other issue is, again, to be, to be um, prudent and penurious with the financial resources, we now have within the denomination what is called the unification, Interim Unification Commission, and what their job or task is, we basically have two large mechanisms in Louisville. The Office of the General Assembly and the Presbyterian Mission Agency, okay? And you can just kind of imagine, I'm sure Sherry can s speak more uh, about uh, the PMA, um, but what these two entities are involved in. There's been a lot of administrative overlap, and I might dare say duplication of administrative between these two agencies. Well, how do you merge them? And how do you make all that happens in Louisville and their outreaches to the local church more efficient. And it's kind of a, a, a um, necessary but um, uncomfortable uh, process that's happening. But again, necessary because of uh, decreasing the financial resources uh, at the denomination level. Mm -hmm. But I would dare say, you know, the denomination is still alive and living, but we have to do so and witness in, in a more efficient manner. Yeah. When we're talking about membership, speaking in membership, it seems to me there are three different th uh, issues involved. One is the church members who just say being a church member is not important to me now. I'm just going to ignore my church. The second is people uh, like uh, you were talking about in areas of country where there are a decent population and the church becomes un unsustainable and closes. Then there's a third group of people who say, well, I disagree with the position that the PCUSA has taken, and so this congregation has decided to leave this denomination and either become independent or join another. Do we have a sense of when we talk about decreased membership, which of these three, uh, how do we rank these three uh, classes? Very good question. I think that's a totally legitimate and valid question, uh, Mickey, and I don't have a simple answer. I mean, what I can say, <coughs> pardon me, about <clears throat> the number crunchers down in Louisville is they probably do have an answer for this. That is, what are the sources of attrition? 
You know, um, is it people who just become disengaged with church life entirely? Whether it's people who are transferring to a different denomination, hmm. or or is it the fact that as the older generation passes on, the younger generation is not as um, me church membership is not as high a priority as the generation that they are replacing. Very, you know, very valid and and and, uh, and, uh, and needed questions to answer. I'm sure there's a number of questions, a uh, number of country down the who, who, who's got the answer. Anything else? Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much, and, uh, Craig. And do read the um, do read the handout, and um, if there's um, you know, feel free to email me if there's something in the handout that you either want more information on or want my perspective on. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. I know. <laughs> and next week we have um, Jacob is going to be doing a presentation on Thanksgiving hymns, so we'll get to hear him. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Okay. Super. Yeah. 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 Yeah.